Um, and welcome to the Future Climate for Africa webinar, Decision Making for African Development and What It Means for Climate Science. My name is Mary Dupar, and I'm with the CDKN, part of the Coordination, Capacity, Development and Knowledge Exchange Unit of the Future Climate for Africa program. I'm absolutely delighted today to introduce Dr. Christopher Jack, at the Climate System Analysis Group of the University of Cape Town, who will be delivering the webinar. First, a few words about the FCFA program itself. It's a £20 million four-year program of the UK's Department for International Development and Natural Environment Research Council. It aims to improve scientific understanding of climate variability and change across Africa and the impact of climate change on specific development decisions. It also aims to demonstrate um, improved methods for integrating climate information into decision making. The overall goal, to improve the long-term development decisions on a five to 30 year horizon for African stakeholders and donors. Now, Dr. Jack is principal investigator for the Fractal research team one of five research consortia that make up the program, and his team is focusing specifically on the Southern African region. Dr. Jack is also a co-author of some of the fact sheets and chapters in FCFA's 2016 cross-program report called Africa's Climate, Helping Decision Makers Make Sense of Climate Information. Today, he'll be sharing some initial insights into his team's work for about 15 to 20 minutes. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And when he wraps up, there will be an opportunity to ask him questions and receive some responses in real time. I'll be facilitating that part. Now over to Dr. Jack. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be presenting this webinar. And thank you, Marie, for the introduction. Just one brief correction, I'm not the principal investigator of Fractal, that's um, Professor Hewitson, but I'm very heavily involved in, in the project and particularly on the climate science side. Um, so today we're going to be covering the topic of decision making for African development and what it means for climate science. And this is obviously a massive topic. <laughs> um, the title covers a lot of ground and we only have 15 minutes, so it's going to be quite a, a rapid tour through, this, um, through the subject but hopefully we can prompt some good discussions and, and some questions at the end. So I wanted to start off, sorry, just a brief overview of what I want to try and cover. Um, and again, each of these is a, is a huge topic in itself, but I want to start by actually talking about the African development decision-making um, context, because I think that is the most important starting point rather than the climate science. Then we're going to talk about some of the state of the climate science that's informing decision making in Africa. And then critically at the end, I want to talk about the relationship between science generally and more specifically climate science and decision making in Africa. So again, as I say, this is a very large topic um, and this is not the definitive um, source of this information, but there, broadly speaking, there are three areas of decision making that as climate scientists we're um, providing information into. The first would be enhancing and optimizing existing activities. So a lot of the work around climate science in Africa focuses on agriculture. And we know that drought and other climate hazards can set a country back in development terms by many years. There have been a number of examples of that in Africa, including Ethiopia and some other countries, where they've been set back many years due to drought and um, famine and food limitations. And this, this happens many, many times. So it's a critical area where climate science can contribute. And then there's the ongoing management of things like water resources and hydropower resources. The recent drought in Southern Africa has been a good example of this, that the challenges of managing these kind of resources um, operationally. Then of course, there's the new infrastructure and investment side where we've got large investments such as irrigation, hydropower, looking at water supply, mining and manufacturing, and roads, ports, urban infrastructures. These are all big investment decisions that various decision makers are trying to make, whether it's development agencies, development banks, um, in-country governments, um, all trying to make decisions around where to place these investments. 
and many of these investments um, require climate information or consideration of climate risk. And then finally, there's the policy planning and strategy um, decision making. This is where policies and plans are set in place and strategies are laid out in order to deal with climate change. It's key at this point to just note that, that there are many decisions can be made without consideration of climate risk, but there are some key decisions that are at a significant risk of failure um, with significant consequences for many, but especially for the poor, if climate risk is not adequately considered. Or, and I think this is really key, if poorly constructed or indefensible climate information is used. So a lot of what we've been doing in the Climate System Analysis Group and in Fractal is trying to guard against this last point of poorly constructed indefensible climate information and how we avoid that. The particular focus of Fractal is, is the urban context in Africa. And the urban decision making is extremely um, complex and, and difficult to, to engage with. So it's an example of decision making in a, in a complex system, not a complicated system, for those of you familiar with the distinction. There's strongly interconnected components across the urban system, ranging from very local scale, private, um, public, government um, components and systems. The physical systems are strongly interconnected. So it forms a very complex system. There's a strong dependence on the surrounding region, often for food supply, for water, for energy. But the city also drives the surrounding region economically and in other ways. So it's a very multi-scale um, decision-making context. It's also a rapidly changing context. We know that cities are growing at a, at a rapid rate, um, particularly in, in Africa. And this, this produces what we call wicked problems or deep uncertainty. There, there are lots of ways of looking at this, um, where we're looking at a system that's changing as we work with it. And then, of course, there's the politics and governance complexity. Um, how, how these cities are governed and managed and the politics behind that. So the big question fractal is how does climate risk intersect with this urban system and other urban, or regional, or even global risks across different time frames. So I wanted to give a quick example, a um, very quick example. It's going to be a rush through here. We're working in Lusaka in the fractal project and we're looking at water in Lusaka. And at first glance, it seems fairly simple. The current status is that about half the water comes from groundwater pumping, but the other half comes from pumping water from the Kufui River. We're looking at a rapid population growth. Estimates are doubling population in Lusaka by 2035. And where it starts getting more complicated is there's a large informal sector, as in many African cities. Um, so there's unregulated, unregulated boreholes. There's informal water supply mechanisms. And then we're having groundwater contamination problems, um, which adds complica complications. So the current development and plans are really looking at development of more groundwater wells um, within the Lusaka area, upgrading the Kafui River pipeline, and possibly even alternative surface supply um, explorations. So the decision dilemmas in this case is, is questions like how fast can we pump groundwater from below the city before the levels drop too far to be economical. In that case, how will climate change affect the groundwater recharge rates? How will climate change affect the Kafui River levels? How will changing flows in the Kafui impact hydropower, which is so critical for pumping water, both groundwater and from the Kafui? How fast will the Saka's population grow in the future and how will that impact demand? How will policies around formalization of informal housing develop? Um, as we formalize housing, we, we tend to increase demand for water in those areas. And then what do we do and can we reduce groundwater contamination? So these are all the decision dilemmas that um, decision makers in Lusaka are facing at the moment. And this is a very simplistic view. It often gets much more complicated than this. Many of those dilemmas have direct climate um, relevance, so a direct need, if you like, for climate information. We can begin to describe some of that. Uh, we can, for the first one, we can say we need information on historical rainfall observations and groundwater level observations. Second one, we need information about future rainfall intensity and distributions of Lusaka. So fairly local scale, perhaps 50 kilometers at maximum. We might need a groundwater model and we might need projections of land use and development. The third one, we need information about rainfall and temperature across the Kafui catchment. 
to now we're at about a thousand kilometer scale. It might be in a hydrology model and projected changes of usage, other usage from the Kufri catchment. For the last one, it's fairly similar. We may now need information about rainfall and temperature again over the Kufri catchment, but now we're looking at hydropower modeling and again projected changes in other usage. So these are the kind of information um, pieces of information that we might need. And information really is the key word. What is information? Well, one definition is that information is anything that affects a decision. So you could have good information and bad information. We're going to assume that we just want good information. Information moves us from a counterfactual decision to a factual decision. And that's the, the, the primary intent of providing information. But I think very, very key, and the point I'm going to make many times is that information is context dependent. So your garbage or your, your noise in the climate science terms may be my information and vice versa. My, your information may be garbage to me, um, if you excuse my use of the word garbage. <laughs> so for this particular case study in Osaka, we need information, how we might define that, across multiple scales ranging from perhaps 10 kilometers local within the city up to thousands of kilometers regarding multiple variables and the characteristics of those variables across multiple time scales. We're interested in sub-daily rainfall intensities through to de decadal mean um, values. We're interested in historical, what's happened in the past, trends, and what's going to happen in the future. We're interested in elements of co-variability across spatial scales. How does rainfall in the Saka vary with rainfall across the Kafui? Do they vary in step or do they vary um, in opposition? And perhaps even co-variability between variables. So how does changes in rainfall vary with changes in temperature? Again, do they vary in sync um, together or are there other more complex co-variability? So where do we start to distill all this information from? And obviously the answer there is at the moment we have climate data. We have a lot of climate data. Um, more climate data than we really know what to do with. Um, I am partly responsible for storing a lot of the climate data in our group and it's a significant strategic challenge. So this is a very simplistic view of our climate data. We have observations on the left. I chose a picture of a satellite there because increasingly our observations are based on satellite data and there's a lot of implications um, coming out of that. On the top right we have global climate models. These are the sort of seminal sources of climate projections information that inform IPCC and um, many, many other climate projections. In the middle there we have downscaling and regional climate modeling. This is where we try and use models and tools to refine the information coming from the global models. And all of this typically will feed into impacts modeling, whether it's hydrology or flood modeling or agricultural modeling. And the impacts modeling step is a really important one that's often been neglected um, in, in climate science work. So we can start looking at some of this information. I'm going to go very quickly here. We're not looking at particular details. Um, all these details are, are described better elsewhere. Um, so the figure here is looking at historical trends in rainfall across southern Africa from a number of different um, rainfall data products. We have approximately 16 products that we're working with at the moment. Um, they all constructed in slightly different ways. And depending on which one you look at, if we sort of zoom in there with the arrows towards where Lusaka is, depending on which product you use, um, you can identify trends of drying or decreasing rainfall or trends of wetting or increasing rainfall. Or if you pick the right product <laughs> or the wrong product, um, you can identify no trend in rainfall. It's interesting that the very high resolution product on the far left there um, is often used because it's very high resolution. Um, and yet it has quite a different message from the other products. So in fact, so we've been trying to understand these historical climate observations and on the right there is a complex figure, it's really a cluster analysis, where we're trying to map out the similarities and differences between the different products. And we're trying to un unpack why those, those occur, um, what primary data sources each product is using, so we can better understand which ones to use in which um, applications and what their characteristics are. I think key here is the graph on the right, which shows the, the number of stations contributing to a particular grid cell in what happens to be the crew um, rainfall product. So this is the station density, if you like. And you can see that there's a rapid drop off from the 1990s in the station um, observing station density in these data products. 
this is the reason why many products are now based on satellite data. But it raises some interesting challenges around um, identifying historical trends and variability as satellite data products have very different characteristics to primary station products. So these are significant challenges. We can also look at global climate models. Um, these are very, very large scale, obviously. Um, these are projections from the IPCC report. And interestingly, on the left-hand side are the new models, as we might describe them. These are the CMAP-5, so the latest and greatest global model projections. Um, projected changes in rainfall for um, various time periods. We don't need to go into too much detail. And on the right are the old CMAP-3 climate model projections. So there's often a perception that the newer models provide are better or different or um, we should be using them in preference. But if you spend some time looking at these figures, you'll see there are some differences between the old and the new, but often the large scale changes are fairly similar. Um, so it's not that necessarily that the new ones are significantly um, different. It is important to note that some of the newer models, the high resolution models, um, are reproducing some climate features better than the old models. Um, but it's not a given. We can zoom into Southern Africa and we can look at a number of different GCM projections for the region. And again, you can start seeing that there's disagreement. And, and this is something we're very familiar with as climate scientists. But again, is a significant challenge for decision making. So if we look around Lusaka, we can see that a number of models show decreasing projections, of projections of drying, and others show increasing rainfall in the future. We normally just group this all under the, the concept of uncertainty in climate science, but naming it as uncertainty doesn't solve the problem for decision making. So we really need to be wrestling with this. Well, of course, often the response is to downscale. There's an implicit um, belief or understanding that if we downscale to higher resolutions, then we get better information. And so the Cortex project was constructed um, in order to facilitate a coordinated regional downscaling across a number of regions, including Africa. Um, this is some examples from the Cordex projects. The top row there are the future projections of rainfall for the end of century from a number of global climate models. The second row is where those climate global models are being downscaled by one dynamical model, downscaling model. And the third row is where they've been downscaled with another regional dynamical model. And I've just highlighted in the red circles there those, the same area, the same GCM forced by two dynamical downscaling models produces quite different future projections. And so now we not only have the global climate models contradicting each other, we have the same global model downscale with different regional models contradicting each other. And so these contradictions and differences are a key area of research within Fractal. Um, so a number of our postdocs and, and core researchers are, are wrestling with how do we understand these and where do we ascribe the information content? So do we believe the Cortex model's um, information more than we believe the global model information? If so, which of the Cortex models do we ascribe the most um, certainty or confidence in? How do we go about um, making these determinations? So the answer to that is complex, and that's what we're working through in Fractal. We need an improved understanding of underlying assumptions and limitations. Where does the signal come from in a regional climate model? We know that it comes from the boundaries as it's forced by the GCM, but these are, these are complex propagations of signal. What assumptions are being made in, in the processes, um, in the dynamical modeling and in the statistical modeling? Often these underlying assumptions and limitations are just are not clearly articulated or understood. In Fractal and in other FCFO projects, we're pushing a strong system or process-based um, view of the data characteristics. Instead of just looking at, for example, rainfall projections or rainfall trends, we want to understand the underlying climate system dynamics behind that. So are the observed rainfall trends supported by trends in the system dynamics? Are projected changes supported by system dynamics changes? Can we identify those? And do that, does that give us more confidence um, in the projected changes? Key to that is understanding how well the models represent the climate system and processes um, relevant to the information context. So on the right there are just some complex science-y sort of figures where we're trying to explore how well different models are representing um, key climate processes and systems. 
And we believe that in order that if we can identify this and understand this, it, it helps us be more confident in the information that we're constructing. Another key area is the added value of downstream products. So does downscaling really add value? If we downscale or run a very high resolution dynamical model or use some high resolution statistical downscaling, are we really adding value? Um, are we improving what the global model information is? Um, higher resolution is not uh, necessarily added value or added information. And how do we quantify the added value in a way that reflects the context relevant information content? So how do we say that a particular dynamical model or dynamical downscaling is actually adding information value to a decision maker in the socket? So in Fractal, and I know in other of the FCSA consortiums, these are the kind of questions that we're wrestling with. So to summarize this part of the presentation, we're not short of data. We have more data than we know what to do with, but not always the data we need. We don't always have the primary observations. We don't always have the socioeconomic context information that we need and, and other data we often are lacking. But we're not short of a lot of data. But there's little understanding of the information content of the existing data. It tends to be taken at face value and used without understanding its limitations, its constraints, and its real information value. There are contradictions and disagreements um, throughout the data, but we seldom really know what to do about them. And so we end up clumping them together into this general concept of uncertainty. Very high resolution modeling or downscaling doesn't contribute new information until we can actually determine its information content in that particular context. Um, and this is seldom done. So while there's efforts within FCFA to do high resolution modeling, we need to be wary that we, we don't automatically ascribe it as information until we're able to determine that. But in order to not be completely negative, at the process system scale, there really are strong confident messages of past and future changes for the region. There are things that we do know and we can say with, with quite strong confidence and that we can defend um, through the science and through the data. And Fractal and FCFA partners are making significant headway in unpacking the information content. So I think we really are making progress in this area, as challenging as it is. Okay, so to end off, I just want to briefly touch on the relationship between climate science and decision making in Africa. And I really believe this is core and it's something we're wrestling with a lot in Fractal at the moment is I think we need to be building a new way of relating to decision making. Why does so little climate science end up impacting, impacting decision making? I know personally I've been producing climate information for decision making for longer than I want to mention. <laughs> um, 15 plus years, I guess, and so often we don't see the impact of that information in decision making. We still see decisions made without considering that. And there are lots of reasons, many of which are not in the realm of climate science, they're in the realm of governance and management and decision making capacity. But some of those, those challenges are in the realm of climate science. A large proportion of climate science is irrelevant to the context because the context really is poorly understood. It's often indefensible because the caveats and the limitations are not well described. It's often adding to confusion and, to be honest, paralysis amongst decision makers. I engage with a lot of decision makers, and I'm sure many of my colleagues do, um, who are just confused by the different, different information and the different messages coming from different sources. And to, to end off on these points, it's often unethical. To come back to my earlier on points, these are important decisions and many of them have um, significant consequences for large numbers of people. We need to make sure that we're comfortable and confident that we can defend the information that we're providing. Otherwise, we're stepping into the realms of the, the unethical. So I think in order for climate science to defensively inform decision-making in Africa, it really needs to shift from feeding into decision-making to being part of long-term relationships including other disciplinary experts. Climate science needs to be able to construct relevant, context-relevant information with defensible justifications. I think this, this is the key point that we're wanting to make um, coming out of Fractal. So towards best practice, to finish up completely now, <laughs> um, I don't know what the, the full best practice is. Obviously, there will never be a definitive best, best practice. So these are some of the, this is some of the thinking coming out of Fractal. We need to be spending a significant amount of time and resource understanding the context. In Fractal, we've, we're nearly two years into the project and we're 
to be honest, we're yet to provide much climate information to decision makers because we spend so much time, importantly, understanding the context. We're using things like heuristic systems models, learning labs, dialogue interviews, and des other desktop analysis to try and really understand these complex contexts. Perhaps the initial climate information should be very tentative and, and termed, if you like, a conversation starter. So in Fractal, we're using climate risk narratives as conversation starters, and these are based on fairly simple climate analysis or climate information. And their, their intent is to start discussions about this intersection between society and climate risk, not to provide definitive information. We need to be very aware of the knowledge of is power dynamics and respect others, other knowledge and other knowledge holders. One thing we're learning in Fractal is to use good facilitators, and these are often not climate scientists. Facilitators can facilitate a process where people are on an equal playing field and all types of knowledge are um, equally considered. Allow the context and the decision makers to steer the process, as scary as this often is, and leading on from that, the possibility that you and your science may be irrelevant in a particular context or particular decision. We need to construct information, not more data. That information has to have assumptions and limits and strengths um, clearly articulated. We need to explore different means of communication. We're using games and narratives. We need to draw on expert input and not ignore the existing literature, which often seems to happen. And then finally, we need to practice humility. We need to avoid providing information you cannot defend, but don't avoid providing information where you can defend it. Often we're too, almost too hesitant to provide climate information. Sorry, this is just an example of a figure of the heuristic um, systems model that we've developed for Lusaka. Um, you can see how complex these kind of contexts can, can become. So that's the end of my um, presentation. I uh, hope, hope there's been some, some good thoughts coming out of that and I hope we can have some good discussion now. I think it's back to you, Murray. Oh, yes, it is. Thank you so much uh, indeed, Chris. And perhaps you would just put your uh, last slide of bullet points up there um, so that uh, the, the viewers can look at that as they're formulating their own questions for you. Thanks very much. Um, now, we're going to be taking questions uh, for Dr. Jack in a written form. So for all of you participants, uh, you'll see on the right-hand uh, pane view uh, there is a question and answer section. So just go ahead and type in your questions uh, for Dr. Jack in the pane, and, and then he can work through them. I've actually, I've got a few of my own, uh, just to, to kick off the, the conversation and allow you to expand on a few points where the other listeners are formulating their questions. So I'll pose those to you. I'd also like to encourage everybody to definitely explore the Fractal Research Team's area of the Future Climate for Africa website, because there you will find some more description of what the project team is up to, including some blogs from some of their initial uh, urban conversations with policymakers in Lusaka. Um, so just visit www.futureclimateafrica.org. Um, click on research teams, click on Fractal, and it will take you to the material. Uh, now, one of my opening questions, I guess, uh, is this, and it's a rhetorical question. <laughs> um, if all of the climate models uh, are giving so many conflicting results for the southern African region, my rhetorical question would be, um, shouldn't the climate scientists go away resolve the differences and then go speak with decision makers when um, there's a bit more resolution. Would you like to address that one to start with? Sure, uh, sure. so it's not rhetorical. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that is often a, a temptation and a, it's a very attractive option, I guess, as climate science to go away and um, come back when we resolve the differences. I think there's two reasons why that's not the right response. The first is we don't know that we can resolve the differences. Um, there are a lot of uh, contradictions, if you like, that may be irreducible, uh, may be fundamentally limited by how well we can observe the climate system, certainly limited by how well we can simulate the climate system. So we may be waiting quite a long time to resolve those differences. I think it's an important parallel process to be 
um, to be working on as climate scientists, but um, we don't know how long that will take. And that leads to the second reason why we shouldn't um, take that, that approach is that we need information now, decisions are being made now, some key, key decisions are being made now, and we need to provide the best information that we can. Um, I just want to follow up on that. While we say there are a lot of contradictions between the CAM models, that, the, the point I made at one point in the presentation was that there is actually a lot of agreement as well. So if we're looking at the large-scale process changes, um, the models are showing strong agreements around things like the shifts in the high-pressure systems and changes in uh, tropical systems, um, various things like middle-latitude um, cyclonic systems. There, there are strong agreements between the models, and we need to be drawing on that, that um, agreement rather than being too distracted by where there are disagreements. I hope that helps somewhat. Thanks very much. I have a follow-up question, um, which is in your uh, you know, initial conversations with uh, city decision makers, um, have you come across any kind of uh, no regret actions that they could consider to make uh, infrastructure for the medium to long term more climate resilient? Uh, even though you may not be able to tell them uh, with much uh, precision, shall we say, exactly how rainfall um, amounts or patterns will change in their city? Yes, I think there are a lot of examples of this. Um, it's, it's another area I've been wrestling with a lot in Fractal is that a lot of the time what we're really looking for in the cities and in, in African decision making is, is for good development decisions. Um, and often good development decisions and um, good infrastructure design, for example, um, is should be fairly resilient to certainly what climate variations we've experienced in the past. So I think that is a, another key point that I didn't bring up enough in the presentation is that um, we, we have a lot of information about how the climate has varied in the past around droughts, floods, extreme events. Um, and even if we're only really focusing on being able to accommodate that natural variability that we've experienced already and we know about, um, would already be a step forward in decision making. In terms of no regrets, um, there's, as I say, there are some things we, we know with some confidence, for example, increases in temperature, and that can be considered. But yes, certainly in a lot of infrastructure design, um, no regrets um, approaches are, are very effective. And, and I would say are being used, not always explicitly defined as no regrets. Great. We have a question from the audience as to whether you can tell us a bit more about the climate risk narratives, including the formats and the context. Thank you. Great. I was hoping somebody would ask that one. <laughs> um, climate risk narratives are my, my personal baby, and I'm very um, keen on on explaining them to people. So um, the idea of the climate risk narratives is is really stems from the, the understanding, the growing understanding that people understand complexity through telling stories. So people use stories to understand complex systems. And we do that all the time in, in life um, generally. And we realized um, over many years that as people engage with climate projections information, they're constructing stories in their head about what the future climate might look like in their context and using um, drawing on the things that are important to them. So the idea of the climate risk narrative is actually to explicitly construct these kind of stories rather than allow each decision maker to um, construct their own stories in, in their heads, if you like. And so we construct um, climate risk narratives. And these are essentially very short sort of story formats. They're between half a page and a page each where it describes an unfolding um, climate or changing climate risk into the future. Um, it pulls in socioeconomic um, aspects as well. So we might talk about, if it's an urban context, we might talk about urbanization and urban population growth. We might talk about um, changing socioeconomic systems. We might talk about changing food supply, food security. And we weave these into the climate um, risk story, if you like. To deal with uncertainty, we have we construct multiple narratives. So often we end up constructing three different narratives, but we, we can do more. Um, and these cover the different plausible futures, um, climate futures. Within each narrative, there's no discussion of uncertainty. The, the climate information is presented as if the climate change has already been, been experienced. 
but the multiple narratives co cover some of the, the range of causable features. We found it a really effective way of engaging with people. People enjoy um, and easily engage reading a short um, story style piece of text. They are strongly supported by climate science analysis, so we always um, present them with the appropriate climate data, if you like, um, that supports them. They're conversation starters. They get people talking about climate in their city and in their context. Um, and we, yeah, we continue to explore how we can use them within Fractal. Thanks for the uh, more detailed information. That sounds fascinating. We have now a question from Sheikh from the Prize Program in Senegal. Um, I'll read it out for everyone's benefit. Now, I know that you're um, more concentrated on Southern African region, Chris, but I think some of the issues raised here um, may actually resonate with the geographic area where you're working. It has to do with applying um, climate information towards planning around the sustainable development goals. So here goes. Um, Senegal's priorities, he says, are generally in line with those identified by the Open Working Group on Sustainable Development. Uh, Plan Senegal Emergent, a uh, flagship policy document, has set policy objectives for the country to ensure economic emergence by 2035. And simulations show that it will be possible to have zero poor by 2030. The expected impacts of climate change on the most vulnerable populations and economy requires us to rethink um, what kinds of knowledge we produce. And so in a context of research into use, the question is this, how to engage with stakeholders from different scales, regional, national, and local, to enable them to use complex data and influence decision-making for achieving SDGs and uh, presumably an emphasis here, particularly on um, that first SDG around eradicating poverty. Great, that's a great question. Hi, Sheikh. <laughs> Good to have a question from you. Um, so, trying to think how to answer this. I think I think it's very relevant um, to what we're working with in Fractal, what we're wrestling with, um, these kind of decision-making processes and how we bring climate science into them. Um, I think, for one thing, I think the climate risk narratives are actually a, a very useful tool um, for this kind of engagement. They allow us to bring climate information, or quite complex climate information, into various contexts, whether it's a workshop or a dialogue. Um, in fact, we're using these learning labs. Um, it allows us to bring that information in a way that everybody can engage with and begin to critique and, and discuss. So we're exploring, for example, in Vinsuk, using the climate narratives to, to explore the um, Namibian climate change strategy um, and policy. So we might say um, climate change strategy says that we want to get to a certain point by this time in the future, this many years in the future. This is where we want to be in terms of um, being resilient to climate change. We can then construct climate risk narratives that bring in the climate change projections um, and weave them into those climate change strategies and see, do the strategies um, stand up under those climate risks or those changing climate risks or do they begin to fail? So it's, a, it's one possibility um, that we're exploring of using climate risk narratives. I think the key um, bigger picture, if you like, though, is we need an, this ongoing discussion and we need all of the relevant knowledge to, to emerge in the process. Um, I think that's that's one of the key points. That third point on that last slide there, knowledge is power, and we need to make sure that all the different types of knowledge um, emerge and, and contribute towards decision making. Traditionally, climate science tends to dominate, <laughs> um, dominate the room whenever there's a discussion. So, yeah, I, it's probably not a complete answer to your question, but I think exploring these alternative approaches like narratives, games as well, that I know you're familiar with, um, are really key. I hope that helps answer some of the question. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, now that I'm looking down the rest of the questions in the pane, I think there are one or two that could be easily answered on the sort of logistical side. One is a question from our colleague uh, Grady Walker in High Crystal, also part of FCFA, 
as to whether you'd be able to share your slides afterwards, uh, Chris. I mean, certainly we could uh, upload these on the Future Climate for Africa website if you're comfortable with that. Yes, certainly. That would be fine. Um, so we can uh, we can do that. Please look for the slides in the uh, fractal part of the FCFA website, um, certainly by beginning of next week. I should also mention that we're going to uh, be posting a recording of this webinar. The webinar is being recorded, um, so we'll put that on YouTube and put a link through to it. And we'd really encourage you to share it with others. That would be terrific. We have another uh, question about, um, I, I think you've probably covered it, uh, actually, uh, Chris, already, but if you want to make any uh, further remarks, um, one of the participants is asking, um, you know, in terms of a World Bank data sets or um, other development agencies who are kind of uh, programming against um, their climate projections for a specific country or region, um, you know, how do you practically, as a decision maker, ascertain whether um, that underpinning climate information is robust? Um, so that's a very general question, and, and um, I don't think we have specific enough um, reference data here as to the particular document for you to give a specific answer, but you may um, reflect on that. And then I'll just uh, throw out there, at the same time, we have a question about the groundwater uh, recharging that you referred to um, as, as being the kind of interesting um, climate information, uh, you know, that, that could be applied uh, towards the Lusaka example, or rather, um, how, how would the future climate impact upon groundwater recharge rates? Um, I think uh, our participants are asking um, whether, in fact, you've been able to uh, answer that question in Lusaka yet. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I think the first question around the, the the knowledge available and the development agencies, knowledge banks and so on, I think is a really key question. Um, I suppose I have sort of answered it, but um, I think the answer is, is twofold. The, the first is that um, as climate scientists, we need to be being um, constructively critical of the information that is made available and that is supporting decisions. Um, I know there's, there's a number of climate scientists that are playing this role, um, but I think we need to be more openly and constructively critical of what, what is available and what is made available. Um, you know, for myself, I'm particularly hesitant of the emergence of more and more climate data portals or information portals, um, where those portals don't necessarily provide information that's defensible um, and, and appropriate. Uh, or can be misappropriately used. So I think that that's the one side. The other side is from the decision-making side. Um, some of it is, is around capacity, but some of it is being willing and, uh, I suppose, brave enough to ask questions of the information um, providers. So challenge challenge the climate scientists, challenge the data portal providers um, to provide defense for the information that they're providing to you um, or that you're wanting to use. So. I hope that's constructive and not too <laughs> critical, but I think more open, honest, cr critical discussions are, are really key. The second one around uh, Lusaka groundwater, there's actually been a fair amount of work already done on Lusaka groundwater recharge. There have been a number of um, previous studies looking at this. The real question for us as, as fractal is, again, twofold. The, the one is how do we um, drive the, the groundwater recharge models with future projections. So what's, what future projection time series or data do we, is most appropriate to, to drive those groundwater recharge models? Um, but the second one is even more difficult, is, is how do we take that information around groundwater recharge into decision making? How do we make sure that our understanding of the recharge rates and how they might change in the future actually impacts decision making? Um, and that's the hardest <laughs> challenge, obviously, um, because we need to know that we're talking to the right people, that the right people are engaging with their information, that we understand all the other things that are, go into making those decisions. Um, so that's, that's the bigger challenge and, and where Fractal is really um, asking a lot of questions. Thanks. Thanks so much. 
Now we have a really practical question from your uh, teammate, Alice McClure at Fractal, and it's about how you uh, really put together an effective team to support decision makers in some of these very complex, even wicked contexts. And she is asking, what do you say the suggested approach that is really understanding the, the socioeconomic context in which you're operating, in which decisions are being made, and having facilitated conversations requires a broader team? And if so, who should be a part of that team, perhaps? Um, or most of all, are we talking about uh, broadening the skill sets of the climate scientists themselves? Great. Thanks, Alice, for asking the hardest question. <laughs> um, that's a really, really good question, and uh, you know we are we're wrestling with this one. In fact, I, I think the answer is is both of what you say. Um, I think it is a question of constructing a, a, the team, if you like, of, of the right people with the, the right skills. I spoke about having good facilitators. We need people who can facilitate. We need people who can who can listen well um, to others um, from different disciplines and across disciplines. Um, so partly it is that constructing that that team, but that team needs to encompass not just the the science experts or the the researchers, but also those making decisions. So somehow we need to construct this network, if you like, of relationships between decision makers and information providers or, or the scientists um, in a way that they, where there's a development of trust. I think trust is a really, a really key element in these relationships. Um, there's a, a length of engagement, so we're not just going to be there for two years, three years, four years, and then we're going to disappear. There's a a belief and a trust that we're going to be around for the long time. Um, so developing this, this kind of network of relationships is really key. In terms of building capacity of the climate scientists, <laughs> that's another big discussion within our group. Um, definitely there's, there's scope for um, building capacity of climate scientists to understand um, the context and how the information is being used, because this is the key process of feeding that understanding back into how we actually construct information and even further back into to how we do climate science, where do we focus our efforts in understanding the climate system. Um, so in, increasing capacity of climate scientists is, um, is really key. We talk a lot about capacity building in FCFA and many of these kind of projects and capacity building often seems to focus on the recipients, increase their capacity to receive the information. Um, in fact, we're focusing a lot of the capacity building on the providers. Um, the, the scientists need to increase their capacity to, to engage with the decision context. That said, there's, there are many climate scientists who are just not the right personality and probably um, are much better positioned um, running climate models or doing primary analysis. And I think we need to accept that that's okay as well. Um, there are different roles for different people. So I hope that's answered somewhat. Thanks. Um, I see there are still lots of questions in the pane, so you've really got um, <laughs> you've got people's uh, brain cells going here. This is fantastic. There's one that's related on the dynamics of those uh, conversations about integrating climate information into decision making, and it's this. I think the question is uh, pertaining specifically to the Lusaka work, um, and that is uh, the question ex in exploring projections of the future and occurrences from the past. Are citizens involved in the process? And if so, how? Yeah, that's a really, that's an interesting question. I'm really enjoying these questions. Um, citizens should be involved, yes, <laughs> um, definitely. In, in fact, all we've engaged with um, organizations like Red Cross, Red Crescent, who are quite involved on the ground with, with citizens, um, particularly in the more informal areas. So. Obviously, engaging at the citizen level takes a huge amount of resources and dedicated time and dedicated personnel um, time on the ground. Um, but we're, we're trying to be sensitive to that in, in Fractal and include organizations that are directly involved in, um, in citizens. I think citizens are really key knowledge holders um, in cities. They've experienced um, the past. They've experienced um, events, if you like, in the past. Um, they know what it's like to not have water coming out of their taps. Um, so I think they're really key knowledge holders. 
they're also key decision makers. So at the citizen level, citizen level decision making is a key driver of how urban um, contexts develop into the future. As citizens make their own personal choices um, about their resource uses, um, about where they live, about how they live, um, those are, are key drivers and we tend to neglect that. We tend to put all the decision making on, on the shoulders of the governance um, or local government decision makers. Um, private sector is also a key um, uh, player in the decision making space. We've got private companies um, in Lusaka who are very key decision makers and we're trying to incorporate those um, in our engagements in the city as well. Now, Peter Ulrich has asked, and possibly um, from the, the point of view of understanding that you don't have limitless funds here, um, perhaps a related question. Thank you, Chris, he says, for your excellent presentation. As you will be aware, there are often serious limitations on funds available to generate climate information for donor projects. Is there a systematic lack of understanding by donors of the complex nature of information provision? And might we overcome this constraint to good quality and well-documented information to decision makers? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I think, yes, I think the answer is probably yes. Um, there, there is an underestimation of the, the amount of effort and resource that um, really should be required to construct this kind of information. There's often the perception that we really just have to massage the data into some kind of context relevant format, um, extract particular variables or run particular statistics. And, and really it's, it's often to do it well and um, requires far more resources than that. So that is the one side. Um, I think the other side is that we haven't, as climate scientists, really developed good approaches to um, constructing this kind of information in a defensible way. So we, we're often reinventing or trying, trying to do it um, independently. We're not learning uh, from each other. I think there's, there's the potential to, to develop um, in collaboration with each other to develop uh, practical approaches to developing this information that doesn't take a huge amount of resources. I'm not, I'm not talking about a one-stop shop, I'm not talking about a, a recipe that's always, you know, you just push the button and it, it does everything. Um, but I think the more we develop appropriate approaches to these questions of added value, of contradictions, um, the, the more we can kind of streamline the process and reduce the resource requirements. One of our future Climate for Africa program colleagues, Dave Rowell, has posed a tricky question. Is there any climate information that is indefensible? Would you give an example? I think my position on that, um, thanks Dave for the good question. I think my position that is climate information is, is only defensible once it's been shown to be defensible. So I wouldn't necessarily give an example of information that's indefensible, but I can give examples of information that is yet to be shown to be defensible. So, for example, um, a good example actually is, is the Cortex downscale projections. Um, I know that they've already been used extensively for decision making, but often they're not, they haven't really been validated or there's, there's no strong defensibility behind them. The, the assumption is because it's dynamical downscaling and it's higher resolution than the global models, that somehow the information content is, is higher or, or better than the driving global models. So it's not that those models, those Cortex models don't have information content and are, are indefensible, um, but I think often they haven't been, uh, if you like, tested to show that they're defensible and we should believe them or believe the information coming out of them over the information coming out of the driving global models. Um, in some cases, it may be that those uh, Cortex models actually degrade the information content of the global models, um, but often we don't yet know that. So that, I hope that's a, a good response, Dave. I'm happy to take a counter question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, just working our way through the remaining questions, we have one, I believe it's from Grady again, uh, which pertains again to the application of information in particular contexts. Um, I myself had raised the query, um, you, you know, how about 
you uh, apply it to infrastructure decisions and no regrets and so forth. He's asking, could you give some examples of specific decisions that could be improved which are not related to infrastructure development? And he's actually asking as well, um, isn't there a more general problem that uh, governments are planning on a one to five year time scale, perhaps in accord with the electoral cycle. Um, and so actually we have this issue to deal with more generally, which doesn't even have to do with the climate. Um, yes, I didn't fully understand the first part of that question, but I can definitely address the second part of the question. Um, I, yeah, I think you're hitting on a, a very key point that we, we're hitting a lot in Fractal, is that the information um, needs, if you like, that are emerging from the city are on very short time frames. Um, and often there's even a confusion, if you like, or um, yeah, confusion amongst decision makers around what we're talking about when we talk about climate change. So in some contexts we've identify this confusion between what's going to happen in the next season and climate change. And obviously as climate scientists we understand the distinction, but often in decision making those two are, are melded together. But the, the time horizon problem is, is really is a significant challenge. Um, we know as, as climate scientists it's very difficult to say anything about the next five to ten years, even though there are some advances in decadal prediction. Um, we're only starting to be confident when we get to 20, 30, 40 years from now. Um, so what, what do we do about that need for shorter term information? So again, this reflects back to understanding natural variability is a key one. Um, we know that while the climate may change, um, the mean climate may change in the next five to ten years, fundamentally the next five to ten years will be dominated by variability that we're already experiencing. So encouraging decision makers to engage with um, natural variability that's already been experienced is a, is a key part of this. That, however, that said, there are decisions made on the short term that um, there's a kind of decision lock-in or pathway lock-in. Um, so a decision could be made on short term based on short term information um, that actually locks that context, be it a city or another, um, another context, into a long term pathway that's very difficult to get out of that may be at significant risk from long-term climate change. So the challenge there is trying to convince decision makers to engage with the long-term um, while their primary emphasis is on the short-term. Thanks. That makes sense. Yes. Um, we have an interesting question here as to whether you've noticed any difference in the reception and the enthusiasm to apply climate information between different sectors involved in city level development. Hmm. That is an interesting question. Um, I think it's been, yeah, it has been quite interesting. I mean, the different cities are, are quite different. Um, for example, in, in Vintuk, we, we had some representation from youth organizations and there was a really strong engagement from, um, from youth representatives in Vintuk, which was unexpected. <laughs> um, and, and yet in some ways expected because the youth are, are the, the people who are going to be living <laughs> and fundamentally um, impacted by long-term climate change. So perhaps that, that kind of dynamic should be expected. Um, typically, you know, those interested in, in water supply um, are very interested in climate change, but referring back to the previous question, they're very interested in what's happening in the short term. Um, I think the, the other areas um, we're struggling to engage with, I guess, um, are the sort of economics planning, because that tends to happen at the, the national scale. Um, so we would hope for more engagement from the sort of national scale economic planning process, um, but we're struggling to some extent to get engagement from them. Um, the other area, or the other sector if you like, is health. Um, so there's some engagement, particularly in Mozambique, around health. Um, but again, health intersection between health and climate, while in some levels is obvious, in other levels is very complex. So I realize I'm drifting off from answering the question here. <laughs> Um, we've engaged in quite a few cities and they're all very different. So, um, yeah, but there, there's definitely different levels of engagement from different sectors and sometimes not always as we would expect. 
Well, I think our time is up and we did finish on a, a difficult but fascinating question there. So thanks again so much, uh, Dr. Chris Jack of the FACTOR team. We appreciate very much your um, insightful presentation today. And as I said, we will be posting the webinar recording as well as the slides on the Future Climate for Africa website. Um, with that, we'll sign off and thanks everybody for participating and for your questions. Goodbye. Thank you. Cheers.